it's a global problem and it all stems from the way we interact with other animals. When we interact in mutually beneficial, compassionate ways, uh, it's good for everybody. Okay. I, you know, I have to say, I started the segment thinking this guy's probably crazy, but I think you're actually reasonable and thoughtful. He is the president and co-founder of Farm Sanctuary. His new book is called Living the Farm Sanctuary Life, the ultimate guide to eating mindfully, living longer, and feeling better every day. Please welcome to the program, Mr. Gene Bauer, sir. Please welcome to our home, our kitchen, Moby and Gene Bauer. I'm delighted to have Gene Bauer here today. He is the president and co-founder of Farm Sanctuary. Time Magazine calls our next guest the conscience of the food movement. Jean Bauer is an animal activist, an athlete, and a 1,000% vegan. With me tonight, Jean Bauer, who is the president and co-founder of Farm Sanctuary. Here with us now, president and co-founder of Farm Sanctuary, Jean Bauer. Jean yeah, Bauer has been the polite today. guy in this debate so far. <laughs> I just wanted, and in you terms do get of the, points for that, but come on. Yeah. Jean Bauer. Well, in terms of the science, there's the China study, which the New York Times called the Grand Prix of Epidemiology, done by Colin Campbell, a, a, a biochemist at Cornell University. We started in 1986, actually, investigating factory farms and finding living animals that were thrown in trash cans or living animals thrown oh, in piles of dead animals no. and so we just started rescuing them. It's, it's harder to eat meat when you know the animal's name. So I true. have found. So true. For me it's really about living as compassionately as possible, not participating in unnecessary suffering, and yes. if we can live well without causing harm to other animals, why wouldn't we? So well, I, I would, I agree, you know what? I agree with you. I'm just going to say it. I agree with you completely there. You know, these are living, feeling creatures, just like cats or dogs. They have relationships with other animals. They have relationships with people. We're in the midst now of an awareness that we need to change our food system. Industrial animal factories store this manure in these open cesspools, and oftentimes it gets into groundwater, it gets into surface water. It, it's tragic if you think about the health problems that we suffer from and we could eliminate 70% of healthcare costs by shifting to a whole foods plant-based diet. How are we going to do it if we don't raise food uh, for billions of people in these controlled situations? Well, the most efficient way really to feed our world is by growing plants instead of animals. You're saying that we shouldn't be cruel to animals, and I agree with you completely, and I, and I hope other conservatives would pause and think about it, because I think a lot of them would agree. Taxpayers subsidize this cheap factory farming food. So the factory farming system is actually quite costly when you look at all the various consequences of it. Half of the water used in this country is used to raise animals for food. Gene, thank you so much for coming on. I know you've just scratched the surface of what's yeah. there, so we'll find out more from your book. Welcome, welcome once more, once more to the Radical Imagination. I'm your host, Jim Vredos. I'm a sociologist who's taught at John Jay College of Criminal Justice and Yeshiva University here in New York City. Gandhi once said that the true measure of any society can be found in how it treats its most vulnerable members. Over 250,000 people die unnecessarily each year in America from what sociologists refer to as structural violence that is social, economic, and political forces that perpetuate inequality in health and well-being. And that doesn't include data from the pandemic. Martin Luther King's characterization of America as the greatest purveyor of violence in the world was not then and is not now an exaggeration. With over 800 military bases around the world, the United States has more than three times as many bases as all other countries combined. In numerous studies and polls, the general consensus among people worldwide is that they feel vulnerable and helpless in the face of United States military might and consider America as one of the major threats to world peace and democracy. That violence extends to America's cruelty and violence to its farm animals and wildlife. Gandhi just didn't mean humans in his statement. Nonviolence begins with what we eat. New data has placed America second to last when con con uh, considering the country's levels of cruelty toward animals only ahead of Belarus in Europe. Through its large-scale industrial factory farming system, it keeps more than 90 million cattle 
and slaughters more than 9 billion chickens and 200 million turkeys a year, close to 29 animals per person every year versus the global average of close to 10. There are signs of a societal shift in consciousness and awareness, however. The animal rights protection movement is one of the fastest growing social justice movements of our time. Gandhi held that the more helpless a creature, the more entitled it is to protection by man from the cruelty of man. Our guest today on the Radical Imagination, Radical Imagination is Gene Bauer, who in 1986 co-founded Farm Sanctuary to combat the abuses of factory farming, advocate for institutional reforms, and encourage a new awareness of animals and the benefits of cruelty-free plant-based living. He's been in the forefront of the animal rights movement and has struggled to transform a world where sanctuary would replace exploitation. The Farm Sanctuary has been collecting data and conducting rigorous research on the inner lives of cows, pigs, sheep, and chickens to change hearts and minds and to alter the way people see them. They've always held that farm animals are sentient beings. As Jean puts it, these animals are more than just pieces of meat. There's emotions there. There's individual personality there. There's somebody, not something. So Gene, thank you so very, very much. It is a real pleasure and honor to have you on the show and, and welcome, welcome. Uh, thank you so much. It's great to be here with you. And uh, I, I also studied sociology. I think it's a very interesting area and it's something that it's very helpful to try to understand why and how we human beings act the way we do and hopefully be thoughtful, discerning, and, and ideally much more kind and compassionate. Absolutely, absolutely. I noticed that in your bio, you are a sociology major at uh, and you're, you're, a, you're a California kid, right? You're from Hollywood. Um, and uh, you, uh, in part, to get yourself through school, you worked in television, right? A little bit in background uh, work in television, which included doing commercials for, of all things, McDonald's and KFC at, at that time. Yes, uh, that is right. And then you went on to graduate work in uh, agricultural economics at Cornell. <clears throat> and then uh, your journey took you uh, into uh, increasing awareness of uh, the animal abuse that was going on in the in, in the factory farms. You started the um, uh, th these farm sanctuary uh, in 1986, and uh, of course, what was also very interesting is that with this fledgling organization, you try to fund it in part by selling vegan hot dogs at uh, Grateful Dead concerts. And, uh, put up my Grateful Dead CD here. Uh, and uh, there it is, more or less. And um, so so tell us about your journey, the, the cultural influence on you uh, as a young man. Uh, yeah, up in yeah, yeah. So like you say, I grew up in Hollywood, California, and mm -hmm. like everybody around me, like my parents, my brothers and sisters, like everybody I knew, I grew up eating meat without really thinking about it. And because I was in Hollywood, there were opportunities to work in the film business as an extra in the background. So I was in commercials for McDonald's and for Kentucky Fried Chicken and for various other companies that I now look at and, and wish I was never involved in supporting them either in commercials or by consuming their products. But I grew up in, in the hills and I saw how wild animals were being harmed by human activity. I remember seeing a beautiful oak tree cut down so a house could be made bigger. And I remember that just viscerally bothered me. Um, I was born in 1962. So in the late 60s, there was a lot of turmoil and discussion about Vietnam and war and violence. And the Cold War was raging, you know, mutually assured destruction with nuclear weapons, you know, the US and Russia facing them at each other. And I 
didn't want to be part of causing so much harm to other animals in the earth or to people. And so I studied sociology and I just started getting involved in various activist organizations, environmental groups, social justice groups, and animal rights groups. And the more I learned, the more I recognized how harmful factory farming is to animals, to people, and to the earth. And so I co-founded Farm Sanctuary in 1986, and we felt it was important to see firsthand what was happening. So we actually started documenting conditions and investigating factory farms and stockyards and slaughterhouses. And we would find living animals thrown in trash cans or left on piles of dead animals. So we started rescuing them. And that's how our sanctuaries began. And so we now operate sanctuaries in New York and California. We work to educate people and we work to enact policies to ban factory farming cruelty and to promote more plant-based food. And shortly after founding Farm Sanctuary, I went to Cornell University. So mm -hmm. I attended as a vegan, sort of uh, quietly to observe and learn about the culture of agribusiness. And that was one of the main things that I found to be valuable about my time at Cornell in ag studying agricultural economics, going to animal science classes, and getting a sense of the mindset uh, behind this factory farming system. And, and that's when you became vegan, correct? Or no, I actually became vegan in 1985. I then co-founded Farm Sanctuary in 1986. I and see. then I attended Cornell in the early 1990s after we had acquired a farm in Watkins Glen, New York. So I was actually at Cornell in the ag school as a vegan. And I remember distinctly being in a class where they were warning us about animal rights people mm. like myself. And they were sort of warning me about myself. And, and they obviously right. didn't know who I was while I was there. Interesting, interesting. So you wouldn't call yourself necessarily a countercultural force. I mean, you were too young to be part of, uh, what was it? The uh, Summer of Love was the, uh, and it was more yeah. than California, right? But 67, oh. Earth Day was not, the first one was 1970. So yeah. you were eight years old there. Um, now, the, the Grateful Dead start 1965 or so. It continued on to 1995. So you missed some of that. But as you say, tremendous uh, conflict and tumultuousness in, in the culture at that time. Uh, but the environmental, the animal rights movement was really uh, not part of, uh, correct, much of the concerns. We were so involved in the anti-war movement, civil rights. And, and so the animal rights was, was a movement, as I've tried to do here in the opening, is something that we need to tie in, correct, to the overall violence that uh, so permeates the, the, the culture. Yes, I think that's exactly right. And I was too young to be sort of a, a hippie protester during the 60s, but that sort of spirit was in the air and i think right. it sort of affected me i remember in high school i used to spend a lot of time in griffith park near where my parents lived and wandering through nature and the greek theater you know often had different um music that they that was played there including by people like pete seeger arlo yeah. guthrie peter paul and mary and listening to that music, you know, was sort of similar to the kinds of messages through the 60s. So that was, for me, very influential. Um, but, you know, I think another part of the 60s counterculture is just questioning what we are doing and, and asking whether we could do better. And, and so I would certainly consider myself part of that, uh, you know, questioning what is considered to be normal. And, and and then asking why and does it make sense? And yeah. we, we grow up eating animals who are treated terribly, supporting an animal agriculture system that is destroying the planet and eating food that makes us sick. So to me, all that didn't make a lot of sense. And, and I was I started questioning it. And, and that's why I went vegan in 1985 and then co-founded Farm Sanctuary in 1986. So we, even in Southern California. That was going on. I, I'm, I'm teasing here a little bit because I, 
I, I, I'm, I'm a New York kid, but I did spend some time in Northern California. And there was a whole, it's a whole other story, the hostility between the North and the South. But there were things going on in, in Southern uh, uh, California as well. But you weren't a merry prankster. You weren't a Ken Kesey merry prankster there. But you were part of this larger awakening back to the country and, and so on. Um, that was so powerful and important, I think. Uh, um, the Woodstock generation in a sense. Do you know, um, I think this might be helpful. Um, can, as we go on with this dialogue today, can you help our audience understand a little more about some of the basic, uh, uh, not concerns, but the terms that we're gonna be talking about, for example, uh, what do you mean when you talk about sustainability or regenerative farming? How does that differ from the factory farming system? What, what does it mean to be considered organic? Or what is kosher or parve? And, and there's so many things that we, what are the different levels of, our, uh, of, of veganism, for example, or vegetarianism? I mean, there's a lot of confusion out there, isn't there? Or can you help us? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm happy to talk through some of these labels and what they mean, and also how in some cases labels are used to sell products and make things sound better than they are. And, and we have seen this with growing awareness and concern about the cruelty of factory farming. We now have labels like free range, for example, mm -hmm. that sound a lot better than they are. And there's basically little to no oversight. So labels are more marketing tools than actually descriptions of what is happening on farms and how animals are raised. And the same could be said of terms like sustainability. Um, now, what is sustainability? Fundamentally, what it means is that you're behaving in a way that is sustainable, where you're not destroying the earth, you're not losing topsoil, you're not losing assets, basically. Uh, but you are regenerating at the same time as you're using. So it is sustainable. It can continue to infinity, essentially. But the way we have been farming is we've been losing topsoil. We've been draining aquifers of water. We're cutting down forests to create more land to raise animals. And this is absolutely not sustainable. And, you know, one of the other indicators of this is the loss of biodiversity. In the U.S., you know, we use 10 times more land for animal agriculture versus plant-based. So animal agriculture demands enormous amounts of land and resources, which is not sustainable, especially as um, our population grows. But what a, a survey showed a few years ago, looking at the mammals on Earth, is a demonstration of just how imbalanced this is and ultimately unsustainable and, and harm will come from it, is that they looked at the mammals on Earth and found that only 4% of the mammals on Earth now live in the wild. 96% are either human or domesticated, mainly farm animals. So we're losing biodiversity, which makes us more susceptible to diseases, uh, pathogens that jump from animals to humans. When you have less diversity, you have less health and well-being, generally speaking. And so we are seeing this uh, globally. And a large part of the problem is animal agriculture, which is also a top contributor to the climate crisis. It contributes more to greenhouse gas emissions than the entire transportation industry. So this is an say, say that, Gary, say that again. Yeah, that animal agriculture more contributes more. more to the climate crisis than the entire transportation industry. Wow. Yeah, that's according to the United Nations. So this is an industry that is harmful for the earth. It is horrible for animals. It is causing a loss of biodiversity. It is increasing human health risks from, in a variety of ways. One are from pathogens, as I mentioned before, that can jump from other animals to humans. And factory farms are a breeding ground for disease where you can find animals by the thousands in cages and crates in filthy, stressful conditions where disease can spread very quickly. This year alone, something like 50 million Chickens and turkeys have died because of avian influenza, which is a disease that afflicts poultry in the U.S. And around the world, it's even more. So this is a disease that is spreading on farms because of the unhealthy and inhumane conditions and also because of the uh, 
risks we are putting the planet through with um, the loss of diversity and loss of a healthy ecosystem. Another risk is antibiotics. You know, most of the drugs and antibiotics used in the United States are fed to farm animals to keep them alive in these stressful conditions and to make them grow faster. And this results in the development of antibiotic resistant pathogens, which can then sicken humans. So that's another problem. Plus, eating too many animal products is just not what our bodies are suited for. Um, and so this is causing heart disease. You know, we are eating way too many animal products and, and it's estimated that we could save 70%, 70% on healthcare in the United States by shifting to a whole foods plant-based diet. So this is a system that is bad for animals, the earth and ourselves. And it's something that we don't have to be part of. It, you paint a picture of such, of such self-destructiveness it's just mind boggling. Uh, and, and you're trying to make inroads in such an entrenched uh, area here. Um, why do you think there's such resistance? Or do you see positive change occurring? I think both. There is positive change and there is resistance. I think that um, people are generally afraid of change. People get comfortable in doing things a certain way uh, and they become, they become normalized. Certain unhealthy practices become normalized. And for example, uh, when people get to be a certain age, it's in many cases assumed that we're going to need to get heart medication or some kind of other medication. But if we lived healthier lives and ate healthier food and ate plants instead of animals, we probably would not need those medications. So, so bad has become normal. And for many people, that's all they know. And I think it's important to be able to demonstrate solutions and to show that you can live well, uh, you can thrive without supporting factory farming and without eating animal products. And there are some very positive signs and there are some wonderful documentaries that talk about this. There's one called Game Changers, for example, that highlights plant-based athletes performing at the highest level, like professional uh, basketball players, uh, Olympic athletes, uh, distance runners, weightlifters, who are plant-based and performing very well. So this idea that we need animal foods for strength or for endurance or for nutrition is completely untrue. Uh, and, and so many people, though, have been sort of acculturated to believe yeah. that we need meat for protein, but that's not true. We've been acculturated to believe we need cow's milk for calcium, which is also untrue. And if you look at countries like the United States, we drink a lot of cow's milk and we also get a lot of osteoporosis. So if drinking cow's milk prevented calcium loss and osteoporosis, we should not see the osteoporosis we do in this country. So. It's just about looking at empirical evidence and looking at what is really happening and then being discerning and making thoughtful and informed choices and being rational. You know, it's, it's been said that human beings are rational animals, but I think it's a lot more accurate to say that we are rationalizing animals and we rationalize things if we're afraid of changing or we, and, and one reason that sometimes people are afraid of changing and afraid of going vegan, for example, is they're afraid they're not gonna get the nutrients they need because they've been sort of acculturated to believe we need animal foods. Or people are afraid they're not going to like the taste of vegan food or they're not gonna be able to succeed at avoiding animal products. So these are all fear-based reasons that change doesn't happen. And I think that fundamentally that's what we're up against, this fear and this uh, comfort in our unhealthy habits. And, and you walk the walk. You're a marathon runner, right? Triathlon. Yeah, so I've done marathons. I did an Ironman. I've done other triathlons. That's correct. Right. So um, I guess Babe Ruth is rolling over in his grave. I mean, stories <laughs> of him eating hot dogs um, in, 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 you know, between innings or whatever. Uh, and then uh, hitting 714 home runs or Mickey Mantle and Billy Martin and Yogi Berra going out and getting a big steak after dinner. So these are not what we need to necessarily believe. And it's so, 
as you say, inculcated in our uh, culture that we need to yeah, have. I, I don't think that Babe Ruth ver lived very long either, you know, and I'm not sure about that. That's true. 49, I think. Why he didn't make it past 50, I don't think. Yeah. So, so I think that, hmm. you know, there are some amazing athletes who can perform at a very high level, but, uh, you know, longevity, there's something about that. There's also something about being healthy into older years, which you also don't see when people, you know, are eating a, a very unhealthy diet or smoking. I mean, there will occasionally be the individual who right. eats meat and smokes and lives into their 90s. That does occur, but it is not the norm. And if you look at the average, you look at most people, uh, smoking is problematic, uh, eating animal products in ex to the extent we do, especially in places like the United States, is problematic. And uh, we need to look at those broader uh, epidemiological numbers and then make informed, thoughtful choices. And you know what I also like very, very much about your approach, although, you know, one could also debate some of that as well, but you meet people where they're at. You're not judgmental about it. As I think you put it, what, uh, you hate the sin, but not the sinner. Um, so you look for common ground. You try to understand people's experiences. Um, could you expand on this a little bit? Yes, absolutely. You know, I think it's important to understand that different people have different access to opportunities, including the opportunity to eat healthy food. Now, I think healthy food should be a right, not a privilege, but unfortunately, it largely is a privilege. And many people live in areas where there is not access to healthy food, to fresh food, to plant foods. And so that's part of, I think, changing our food system to make healthy plant-based food accessible, affordable to everybody. Um, and also, just realizing people have different lived experiences. And for me to try to dictate to somebody else how they must live uh, is wrong for so many reasons. One is that I'm not in their shoes. I really can. And I think it's important for us to empathize and to recognize that each person has their own challenges, their own struggles, their own difficulties. And then to find out how you know we can support each other, really, in living more compassionately, living in a more healthy way, in a more meaningful way, where we are not causing unnecessary harm on the planet. And I think when we look at common ground, I think most people would rather not cause other animals to suffer needlessly. So I, I assume that and sort of work from that perspective. Mm -hmm. I also assume that most people would rather live on a planet that has clean water, clean air, healthy soils, healthy ecosystems, it doesn't face climate crisis the way we do today. So I assume most people want to live on a, a healthy planet that's not being destroyed. Uh, so I think that's common ground. And then also, I think most people would rather eat food that is nourishing and supports good health and, and thriving instead of food that makes us sick. So those are my kind of assumptions about common ground. And there's a lot to work with there. And uh, the, the factory farming system we have today is really predicated on extraction and exploitation, you know, as opposed to creating relationships with other animals or people, including workers or the earth, uh, relationships that are based on mutuality. So to me, that's the big framework to move away from relationships and systems of extraction and exploitation to systems and relationships based more on mutuality, where it's a win-win for everybody involved. So incremental change, you can't do everything all at once. So if somebody, now we're, we're by the way, we're taping this the day before Thanksgiving, uh, unfortunately, it's going to be aired after, but so I was telling our pro producer Tiffany before, uh, well, how is she going to celebrate Thanksgiving as so many millions and millions of Americans are with their family turkey? So what practically concretely can you tell people in the face of what uh, is so ingrained in us? Um, what is a step, an incremental 
step or change that you would like to see happen, if not this Thanksgiving, you know, next next one? Um, I think the first thing is just to encourage people to think about the impact of their food choices and to recognize that we actually have a choice, that we can decide not to have a, a, a turkey for Thanksgiving, for example. And one of the ways that we at Farm Sanctuary have worked to try to show a different alternative for the Thanksgiving holiday is to develop our Adopt a Turkey program where people can sponsor a turkey who lives at Farm Sanctuary. And we send them a picture of the turkey that they're helping to save and information about that individual animal and also information about healthy plant-based foods. Uh, so they can have a Turkey Day celebration without having a dead body in the middle of the table, but instead celebrating the life of an individual who has been rescued and allowed to live at a sanctuary. So that's a concrete way that people can celebrate a different kind of Thanksgiving or holiday season. Uh, but each person has to make their own choices. Uh, for some people, it might mean eating less animal products. Uh, for some people, it might mean going vegan. Uh, but each person has to, I think, make their own choice, but it's important to make informed choices and to recognize that each of us, including vegans, can make changes that are good for other animals and for the earth and for ourselves. We're all works in progress. Nobody yes. is perfect, mm -hmm. not even the most vegan vegan. So each of us, I think it's, it's just important to be mindful and try to make conscientious choices that we can feel good about and, and that make a positive difference. Okay. Agree. So informed choices. So help us again. We going back to one of my first questions. A lot of things that are said, well, farm raised, free range, organic, is not really that. So what should we be looking for? You talk about plant based. We don't need cow's milk. So we're talking about right soy milk, correct? What is what are some of the other things we should be looking for that we can pick up on? Those of us who are in uh you know rural areas or areas where we can go to local farms and so on and farm stands yeah what what should we be looking at very concretely what you know what what do the labels what what labels can we look for and have some trust in uh in terms of what you're talking about here you know i, I would say that a general rule of thumb is that more disconnected the consumer is from the source of their food the easier it is for labels to misrepresent the reality. So chain supermarkets, for example, uh, you know, remove consumers very far from the source of their food. And that's where the labels are going to be probably the least accurate uh, in terms of reflecting how the animals are raised. One of the best ways to really know how animals are raised or how food is produced is to visit the farm. So if that's a possibility in, 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 in rural areas, it may be a possibility. That's the best way to really know. Uh, but it's also important to recognize that in some cases, you have farms that have a show farm that will make things look really good. But if it's a larger operation, they might have other farms where the conditions are not as good, uh, but they will not show you those. And the industry, and again, the larger these operations are, the more likely they are to be misleading, I would say, and the easier it is for them to mislead and misrepresent what's happening. Um, but I think, you know, it's, it's, I wish it was easier. I wish it was easier. But um, unfortunately, uh, there's not really an infrastructure in place right now. And so consumers have to take some responsibility to try to learn what is happening um and yeah support local health stores uh health food stores is it um uh, is, is kosher food generally seen as a little more i don't know yeah. kindly and if you will less cruel and in, in ours what yeah. are we talking about here yeah. i i think kosher slaughter was originally intended to have it so animals died with less pain and less suffering. But like in other circumstances, when you have businesses that are look looking to profit, yeah. there is a tendency to cut corners, 
for animals to be killed more quickly than they can than they should be and for animals to suffer terribly and there have been exposés of industrial slaughterhouses killing animals for a kosher market that were atrocious so um again if if their labels unfortunately are not always very accurate labels allow retailers to add pennies or dollars to the price and so there it's actually in the industry's in, uh, economic interests to label things a certain way even if it's not accurate and, and kosher could sometimes fall into that category unfortunately so the best thing is to try to as best as possible get more localized in in your eating and uh even urban gardens right urban yes. gardens that we can develop um within the city. we're in new york city here right so well, not, there's you know not many people are going to run out to the farms here although which we could in a way, yes. It's, it's amazing what you can do even yes. in cities. You know, there's an organization called Harlem Grown that yeah. grows food around Harlem. There's another one called Green Bronx Machine that works with kids to grow food. Okay. Um, there, there's a, a urban farmer in Los Angeles. His name is Ron Finley, who says growing your own food is like printing your own money. There's a Food Not Lawns movement. And, you know, we've got tens of millions of acres in irrigated lawns across the United States. Can you imagine if we were growing produce instead of grass clippings mm -hmm. on those lawns? So there's a lot of land, a lot of resources, a lot of energy that is available to be used in a more sensible way to grow food instead of just lawns or to grow food instead of having a, an abandoned lot, basically. And you also have urban farms, you have rooftop gardens, uh, but community gardening is a beautiful movement that connects people to the land, uh, provides healthy food locally. And oftentimes, you know, there's this assumption that we really couldn't feed ourselves that way. We really need factory farms. Well, in fact, during World War II, when we had the Victory Gardens, over 40% of the produce was produced in Victory Gardens, these small local really? farms that were in urban areas, rural areas, suburban areas. So I would love to see a return to that type of diversified, localized, community-oriented plant-based agriculture. And I do believe it can go a long way towards feeding us. And, and in different communities, you'll have different types of food that grows more readily. Uh, you can also add greenhouses in certain areas where you have colder climates to lengthen the growing season. You can do canning, you know, root cellars. There's all these traditional methods we have used to grow and store food over the course of human history that make sense. They're sustainable. They don't require a lot of energy compared to what we're doing now. And so I think returning to some of these tried and true, uh, sensible, sustainable, uh, healthier options uh, is something that we should look at doing more of. Use our creative, radical imagination. Yeah, man. I, I no, um, listen, I had grandparents that lived into their mid to late nineties on both sides of my family. And they came from the old country in a sense, and they were, had eaten you know, the, the products there from the, from the land. And I, I, I'm convinced it sustained them and, and, and kept them, uh, enable them to have very, very long, wonderful lives. And so, you know, what I want to ask you is how much connections do you, have in your animal rights movement to other movements the well of course you mentioned the environmental movement but how about the peace movement or i was thinking as i was preparing for the show um the criminal justice movements uh such as prison ab abolition i think there's uh, if you think about it you don't have to think about that long but there's very great parallels isn't there between uh you and an Angel Davis are calling for the abolition of prisons. Yes. You're trying to abolish the prisons for farm animals, aren't you? Yes, absolutely. And Angela Davis, by the way, is a vegan. So that's pretty cool. Great. And, yes. and her sister too, Fanya, I'm, I'm sure she is too, I would imagine. Who is that? Fanya Davis. Um, I, don't, I don't know who Fanya Davis is. Fanya, so. her sister who's up in Oakland. That's right. So okay. there you go. Northern California. Yeah, no. right. No, I think that there's an awful lot of overlap between these various movements towards liberation and away from oppression. 
which also in my mind is our movements away from extraction and exploitation towards empowerment and mutuality, agency, sovereign, sovereignty, things like this. So this is where growing food can be so empowering. Um, but yeah, and, and just an example of how on the factory farming side, there's a big overlap between the carceral system and factory farming is that you sometimes have labor that comes out of, you know, is taken from imprisoned people on factory farms. And earlier I had referred to how this year, tens of millions of chickens and turkeys have died from avian influenza. Uh, the first human who was infected with that disease during this recent outbreak was actually somebody who was imprisoned uh, in Colorado, and he was working on a factory farm with chickens who were diseased, and this imprisoned worker wow. got, got infected. So that's just an example of how you have this overlap and this alignment of oppressive industries on the one hand, but you could also then have an alignment of liberation groups and, and movements towards a new food system. I mean, Fannie Lou Hamer way back when was talking about this. She wasn't vegan, but she was talking about this. Um, oh gosh, what's the name of that comedian? Uh, Dick Gregory. Dick Gregory. Oh yeah, another another. I the Bohemian diet. The Bohemian. He was vegan. Diet. Yeah. He was vegan, so he's a yeah. civil rights, animal rights activist, right? right. And, and and some of the environmental groups now are coming around to connecting more to animal agriculture. So we have. I think a convergence of issues here, uh, whether it's animal rights, human rights, civil rights, environmental issues, uh, global justice issues, peace issues even, uh, that are very much linked in. And, um, I, and my belief also is that violence creates more violence. In yeah. animal agriculture is one of the most violent industries that's ever existed. In fact, you know, after World War II, many of the technologies and the petrochemical industries that were invested in selling products and, you know, and engaged during the war uh, tilted their manufacturing towards farm equipment, farm chemicals. So, you know, we really could see a shift from, again, swords into plowshares, you know, this idea of taking that energy and putting it into healthy food instead of this factory farming food, which unfortunately we currently have. Absolutely. This, I, I also have a, a couple more questions, but I want to give us, make sure we have enough time. I want you to talk about this incredibly wonderful article that came out in the Times Tuesday, Science Times, More Than a Meal. It's a very extensive uh, article about the farm sanctuary, studying the inner lives of cows, pigs, sheep, and children, uh, and chickens to alter the way people see them. And Tell us about the methodology that you've been using there, the, the, the purpose of all of this to, to uh, humanize uh, and personalize uh, the, animal, uh, the animal struggle that you're involved in. Yes, yes, yes. At Farm Sanctuary, we take care of animals who have been rescued from slaughter, and our research team is doing some really innovative work to try to understand the inner lives of these animals and to do it in a way that is re respectful. You know, so often when you think about animal research, you know, animals are subjects, they're exploited, um, and they're, they suffer terribly in a very cruel system. At Farm Sanctuary, we you know, the animals are our friends, not our food. Mm -hmm. And they decide if they want to participate in yeah. these non-invasive studies, you know, Love they it. decide Love it. Yeah. To, to volunteer, to, to show if they get excited about food, for example. And so we're being very respectful. And to me, a big part of this undertaking is about how it is being done. It is being done in a way where the animals are participants, co-creators, not subjects for us to control. Um, they have agency, they have sovereignty, uh, they have their own desires that are allowed to be fulfilled instead of us imposing our will and our power and control over them. So to me, that's one of the most exciting things about this work. And we loved the New York Times article about it. Uh, the headline, more than a meal, I think was really telling that these animals are in fact individuals 
And we should see them as living, feeling creatures who deserve kindness, deserve respect. And I would also say that when we treat other animals with kindness, it's not only good for the other animals, it is actually good for us. You know, whereas when we kill other animals and treat them with cruelty, that undermines our empathy. And empathy is a very important part of our humanity. And when we lose that, we lose something very important. And I would also say that power uh, and, and humans have a tendency to grasp for and desire power. Uh, this also undermines our empathy. And it's linked to the whole meat industry because killing and eating other animals is a very clear demonstration of power and uh, over somebody else and oppression over somebody else. And uh, the victims of this suffer, but the perpetrators of it also, I think, uh, suffer in, in ways that we don't quite fully grasp sometimes. And uh, it undermines our humanity, which is, which is tragic. It's such an important point. It, 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 it's a profound point that we don't realize that we are become victims of our own violence that, that we're perpetrating on others. Um, and there's consequences, whether we realize it or not. Um, um, it was connected to a statement by Martin Luther King. Um, do you worry? that violence is so structurally endemic to the ethos and distorted morality of our culture that despite our best efforts as America might go to hell as Martin Luther King worried as well. Um, I mean, in other words, is our distorted morality, our sense of our, our this distorted need to dominate and to, to um, control um, there seems to be this this historical concern of doing that with all of so many different peoples around the world. Um, is that going to? How can we counteract that through what you're trying to do? I guess is what I'm saying. You know, it it, it is absolutely a distorted way of being on the earth, and I think that we need to be very open-minded and recognize what behaviors, what kinds of attitudes cause harm. And I think we need to look for examples that are the opposite of that. And I think some of this, you know, you know, has existed over the course of human history. I think that there are, you know, Asian cultures that have been actually vegan and the concept of ahimsa, I think is very important. I think indigenous cultures uh, around the world have had glimpses of living sustainably in, an, in a respectful way with the earth. I think, though, as human beings have garnered more power and more ability to control things around ourselves, we've sort of lost that connection to the earth. And I think we need to regain that and we need to um, be more humble and, and act in more, you know, empathetic ways to other beings beyond humans, uh, although we're pretty bad between human to human as well. Uh, but I think a large part has to do with our respect for others, our empathy for others. And that's why I think the research we're doing in Farm Sanctuary now is so innovative and important. It's because these other animals are co-creators with us. They are not subjects for us to control. And I think that general attitude towards co-creation and humility uh, is, is, is something humans need to learn. And, and the more power we have had, the more we have lost that, that empathy, and we need to get it back. And the more we will respect ourselves as well, because um, I agree with you. I think a lot of people are really um, horribly conflicted and, and angry and frustrated at what they see around them and, and don't want to be part of that. Let me ask you this in the few remaining minutes we have. What are some of the legislative victories you've had over the years? Well, we've worked on legislation since the 1980s because we realized we could not rescue our way out of the factory farming problem. We've succeeded in banning the slaughter of downed cows. These are cows too sick to walk. That's a big victory. We've succeeded in banning some of the worst confinement systems where animals are in small cages where they can't move. So about 10 or so states now prohibit some form of that inhumane confinement. We've been able to ban the production and sale of foie gras, which involves 
jamming a pipe down a, the throat of a duck or goose to force feed them to make their liver expand 10 times normal size. Been able to ban that in California. We've been able to challenge some of these ag gag laws where the industry is trying to prevent discussions and exposés of their cruelty. We've been able to succeed in court pre preventing some of those things. And, and now what we're doing is looking at resources, looking at government subsidies, trying to take the billions of dollars that are currently used to support factory farming and shift that towards a more community-oriented plant-based food system. So right now we're, we're, we're looking to new opportunities to take existing resources and move them in a better direction. So that's a big part of our focus right now. Excellent, excellent, excellent. And where do you stand on this so-called fake food, fake uh, meat? What does McDonald's have, the Impossible Burger here? Yeah, yeah, well, it's much better to have a plant-based burger instead of a beef burger in an impossible whopper but a bigger question is do we even really want to have burger king in the first place right so right. less bad is better than more bad but i am also for a complete shift in the food system right but incrementally if you have this is better to have the impossible burger than the the, the yes. triple cheese bacon burger or whatever that absolutely is. much better so, right 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 so um so the thing that people can do is be more and more careful about and make choices, make choices in their own, for their own benefit, which is going to help the world and, and the animal world that you're trying to sustain as well. Uh, we need to become more aware of the choices we have, as you're trying to help us do, um, and, and really live that life of integrity um, that will make us all feel better and become less violent, I think, generally. I think that's true. Violence creates violence. And when we have violence on our plate, I think it's it affects us in ways that we're not even aware of. Very interesting metaphor. Right. Take it off our plate and uh, adopt a turkey. That's right. This holiday, adopt a turkey instead of eating one. Adoptaturkey.org. And also our website is farmsanctuary.org. Yes, I wanted to make sure that, that people knew how to re reach you. And uh, uh, and, and that, again, repeat, repeat uh, how we, we can get hold of you. Yeah, to find out more about Farm Sanctuary, check out our website, farmsanctuary.org. We also are on Twitter and on Instagram. So Farm Sanctuary. And if you're near on the East Coast, you can go up to Watkins Glen, which is what, three, four hours out of the city? Yeah, it's, it's probably more like five hours, but it's a beautiful wow. sanctuary in the Finger Lakes region. We have overnight accommodations, really? uh, tiny houses and bed and breakfast cabins up in Watkins Glen. We also have a farm near Los Angeles in Acton, California. We don't have overnight accommodations there, but we do events. We do regular tours. So check out our website, farmsanctuary.org, okay. to get involved and also to visit one of our sanctuaries. I'll try to make a visit up to Watkin Glen. Thank, Thank you, Dean, so much. It has just been an honor and pleasure to have you. Carry on, be strong, and, and take care. Thank, thank you, you so Jim. Much. You, you as well. It's been my pleasure, too. And thank you so very, very much for watching us here on The Radical Imagination. We want to thank Gene Bauer for being on the show this week, and we'll see you again next week on The Radical Imagination. Sanctuaries are a place where cruelty is met with kindness. It's about kindness to animals, but it's also about respecting others, respecting ourselves, respecting the earth, living in a way that doesn't cause unnecessary harm. We live at a time when there's immense oppression and strain and ugliness out in the world, and this harms all of us. The reason things are as bad as they are is because we have infrastructures and systems in place and those need to be shifted. It actually undermines our empathy and that's a very important part of our humanity. For me and for many people, this begins with recognizing trauma and violence and cruelty in the world and not wanting to be part of it. These animals, like other animals, want to live. They don't want to be abused. They don't want to be killed. They don't want to be eaten. They want to live just like cats or dogs or us. We're all animals and we all have pretty much the same desires.
I got this van in California in the early mid 1980s. We used this van to do investigations of farms, stockyards, and slaughterhouses. And the way we funded the organization back in those days was selling vegan hot dogs at Grateful Dead shows out of this van. It was an open-minded crowd. And I remember on occasion, somebody would come up and stand in front of our table and look at these images and just be affected by them and start crying. Hilda, our first rescued animal, was rescued in this van, who we found left on a pile of dead animals behind Lancaster stockyards in Pennsylvania. So we took her off the dead pile, brought her to a veterinarian, thinking she would have to be euthanized. As the veterinarian was examining her, she actually started perking up, and then she stood up. And she lived with us for more than 10 years. And she's actually buried uh, up on the farm right now. It's not possible for sanctuaries to rescue all the animals who are currently being exploited and slaughtered. So we need to change the system. And farm sanctuaries play a very important role in modeling a different kind of relationship with other animals. The animals become ambassadors, and people who are touched by them can go out and educate others.